Good afternoon and good morning to all of our attendees. I'm so happy that you could join us today uh, for this session on updates in juvenile localized scleroderma. Um, today joining us is our wonderful speaker, Dr. Suzanne Lee out of Hackensack University um, in New Jersey. Thank you again for joining us and I'd pass it over to Dr. Lee. Okay. Thank you, Angel. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'm really delighted to talk to you today about updates in juvenile localized scleroderma um, and to be at the Kids Get Scleroderma 2 conference. Um, please feel free to um, ask questions. Uh, really welcome that. So these are my disclosures. I have some funding support for research uh, studies, including from the National Scleroderma Foundation. And uh, this is, oops, sorry, this is an overview of my talk. I'm going to be talking about what is scleroderma and localized scleroderma versus systemic sclerosis, what grows wrong in this disease, uh, what problems are associated with localized scleroderma, especially in kids, how do we manage and treat this disease, long-term prognosis, and just touching on some research studies. So what is scleroderma? Scleroderma comes from the Greek words for hard skin, but it also involves other tissues, and we call this extracutaneous involvement. It's two diseases, localized scleroderma, which the dermatologists refer to as morphia, and systemic sclerosis. These are both rare diseases. Um, the overall incidence in the United Kingdom for both diseases was, you see, um, quite low, which um, if we translate that, that's about 100-fold less common than cystic fibrosis. About one third of localized scleroderma begins during childhood. Key, patho key, patholo key pathology with this uh, disease is inflammation, um, in particular autoimmunity, which we'll touch on briefly, and fibrosis, meaning scar tissue formation. So there are many differences between localized scleroderma and systemic sclerosis. And a key uh, thing to keep in mind is that one disease does not turn into the other. So if you have localized scleroderma, you're not really at risk for systemic sclerosis. Um, and there have been a few case reports of patients with systemic sclerosis developing localized scleroderma lesions, or a few cases of localized scleroderma becoming systemic, becoming systemic sclerosis, but um, this just the same pattern as we see with other rheumatic diseases that people can have arthritis and lupus, so generally, if your child has localized scleroderma, you should not be concerned about systemic sclerosis. So among the differences are the skin pattern. So in localized scleroderma, it's usually unilateral, just one side, whereas in systemic sclerosis, it's bilateral and tends to be symmetric, as we can see on the hands here. In uh, localized scleroderma, the extracutaneous involvement is in 40 to 70 percent, so still most of the children, but it's uh, even higher in systemic sclerosis, 50 to 90 percent. They both share involvement of joints, muscle, tendons, and bones. Um, the localized scleroderma also can affect um, teeth, eye, brains, and nerves, especially for the patients that have uh, lesions on their head but the involvement is usually near where the skin lesions are located. In contrast, systemic sclerosis affects um, more central organs, lung, heart, gut, kidney, also affects the blood vessels in a pattern called Raynaud's phenomena. And um, this, of course, is much um, a great concern. Uh, so it accounts for the difference in mortality where there is a significant mortality risk with systemic sclerosis, but this is not something um, we associate with localized scleroderma. There is a difference in autoantibody pattern also. They can both have the ANA, but this is at a much higher frequency in systemic sclerosis, and many other autoantibodies are found. So uh, these, this kind of pattern shows you why it's called systemic, because there is more widespread involvement of the body. So in scleroderma, the normal healing process is disrupted. So our body has many defenses, and a major one is the skin, which is going to protect us against germs and foreign material. But as we all know, injury is very common to the skin, so we could get a splinter like here, and that um, splinter or other foreign material is going to trigger 
inflammation, which is another body's defense against foreign material. So that inflammation, so that inflammation we all know, like the bite, there's going to be swelling, redness, warmth. Um, and this is sort of driven by these cells that are in the blood vessel that will then come out at that site of injury. And our defense system is the immune system, those cells in the white blood, in the uh, vessels. And there's two arms to it. There's an innate, which works in minutes to in minutes to hours. So very quickly, mosquito bite, we're going to get some swelling. And then we have the adaptive arm, which takes days to weeks. So this arm is very important for when we get vaccinated. Um, it's going to, it's, this system is learning to recognize that germ that we get vaccinated against, like the flu. And it's two types of cells, the B cells, which make antibodies. And so that's a B cell here. So it's secreting these antibodies like you see here, and those can go and bind the target like the flu. And then there's T cells, which also have receptors against the germs, but they stay on the T cell. So they're directly attacking the cell. If this is misdirected, meaning it's attacking our own tissues, we're going to get autoimmunity. Then healing normally involves inflammation and fibrosis. So that inflammation is really important for repair because it's triggering fibrosis. And fibrosis means that we're going to get some of this extracellular matrix like collagen secreted to bring the wound edges together. And that's going to form like the scar tissue. So here in this mock-up of like the injury to the skin, we have those um, inflammatory cells from the blood vessels here. And then we have collagen producing cells in yellow, and that includes fibroblasts as well as myofibroblasts. And this is just showing you what a myofibroblast looks like. So you can see that it seems to have these long arms extending. So you could see how that could be very good for grabbing onto the edges of the wound and bringing it closer together. And then after that repair happens, the body will clean up that site and return to normal. So we get back to our um, skin with all its structures and intact uh, surface. So that cleanup, so that cleanup means we have to get rid of any engine that's made. And then we also want to get rid of all these excess cells that we no longer need. We don't need all these inflammatory cells and we don't need these collagen protecting, uh, collagen producing cells. So they're going to undergo cell death. So then what happens in scleroderma is that there's more inflammation. So we have more immune cells, immune cells going there, and then it's persisting longer. So in this um, skin biopsy, we can see these dark purple areas, and that's where um, inflammatory cells, that represents inflammatory cells. So you can see that there's these large clusters, much more than what would normally be present. And then in addition, there's too much fibrosis. So that inflammation is supposed to trigger that repair, but here in scleroderma, the repair doesn't stop. So we have too much collagen generated, so we have an increase in that fibrosis. And this is gonna to lead to losing the normal tissue structures. So here you could see in a biopsy of a scleroderma skin at a later stage, it's all very smooth. Okay, the inflammatory cells are now gone, but it all looks very bland because this is all collagen. So we've lost all these normal structures like hair follicles and sweat glands. So what are the skin patterns of localized scleroderma? Uh, we have five patterns, the most common being circumscribed or plaque morphia linear scleroderma. These two are the most common in kids with linear scleroderma, the most common. And, and so the plaque lesions are these oval lesions, which could be flat, superficial, or depressed, deep. And then linear is called that because the lesion looks like a, a streak or a band, okay? And th that could be on the head, which we call uncudisab here, or on the trunk or limb. This boy is going on his arm, onto his back. And then there's another form when it's on the head, which is called progressive hemifacial atrophy or periromberg. In this case, you don't see so much skin, um, skin lesion. Uh, maybe there's one here, but you see that this side of the face is smaller. And so uh, there's his nose is smaller, his eyes at a different position, his mouth is smaller. So there is inflammation in the underlying tissue, which causes loss of the substance there. Generalized morphia refers to having larger plaques, which are on two or more regions. 
Pansclerotic morphia is, is very rare, fortunately, because it's it's the most severe form. Here we can have very extensive skin the skin um, lesions that around the limb. Um, and mixed morphia is something also more common in kids, along with linear and circumscribed, and that is where you have a combination of any of these other four. Usually it's these two, the circumscribed and the linear. So what problems are associated with localized scleroderma? So we have skin problems. Skin problems, so we can have tightness, which is gonna decrease the mobility of that area, and the skin could feel kind of off, like itchy or funny feeling. The appearance, of course, is gonna be affected, so it can look darker, it can look lighter, thinner and depressed, and we can get hair loss from that. The extracutaneous problems are um, many that can affect function and appearance. So we can get arthritis. We can get the joint sort of being limited in range of motion and maybe angulated differently. The limb could also be shorter. Um, you can see that there's also less muscle. And then uh, we can get effects on the eye. So here the eyes are not aligned. So we can get like strabismus or inflammation in the eye. We can also get problems with the teeth not being aligned or missing. And then um, concerning is we can get neurological problems like headaches, seizures, and neuropathy. And extracutaneous involvement has been found to be associated with um, problems such as more symptoms. There are more symptoms and they're more persist persistent. And these symptoms can include problems like trouble playing or joint problems. Parents rate their child is having a higher disease impact if they have extracutaneous involvement in red compared to the, the those parents that have a child that doesn't have extracutaneous involvement in blue. This was a prospective uh, study looking at three time points, zero, three, and six months. And physicians will rate these patients as having more damage. So again, in red is the patients with extracutaneous involvement, and in blue is the patients without extracutaneous involvement. Juvenile localized scleroderma is worse than adult localized scleroderma. And so there are several reasons, reasons for that. So one is different. So it tends to be those that involve deeper tissue. So linear scleroderma is the main type found in kids. And that's typically deep tissue involvement, like on this leg. Whereas plaque morphia, the circumscribed like this, is more the main type in adults. And usually it's the superficial form. So it's just skin involvement. involvement. Kids also tend to be sites affected than adults. In addition, extracutaneous involvement is more frequent and often more severe. So it's 2.5 times increased prevalence of extracutaneous involvement in kids than adults for the linear subtype. And the kids, because they're growing, have a risk for growth problems. So hemiatrophy, like unfortunately this child with her face. Um, and we have those joint angulation defects, limb length differences. The neurological eye uh, oral involvement could be more severe as you could, which is I think is gonna be associated with the growth problems, right? So if you're not growing normally, that eye is not gonna develop normally. Kids also have a longer disease duration, uh, which is likely partly related to the subbite pattern and extracutaneous involvement. So the active disease in a couple studies has been found to be in the 13 to 14 year range versus in adults, it's four to five years. So how do we manage and treat localized scleroderma? So our current treatments are targeting inflammation because we have little available to target fibrosis. So as I showed you before, that inflammation, that's where our medicines are mostly working. And then when you get to this fibrosis stage, few medicines are available, though, though that is uh, changing, fortunately. So the option, the strategy then is to decrease that inflammation. So we try to limit advancing to uh, severe fibrosis, and that way we can limit damage risk and development. So we have topical and systemic treatments. And um, the idea with both is we're trying to turn off that inflammation. So we're talking about immunomodulation. We're targeting inflammatory cells and mediators of inflammation. We, some of this medicines might be inhibit, inhibiting replication of the cells. 
preventing recruitment or triggering of other inflammatory cells. Topical treatments include things like creams or ointments that have steroids in them, tacrolimus, vitamin D derivatives, or, in, or imiquimod and therapy. The limitation with topical is it only works where it's applied, and it also has a limited depth of penetration. So if you have someone that has a large lesion, it would be a lot to put on the cream. If you have someone that has a linear lesion, this is not going to get down to the muscle or deeper. It's only going to reach even the upper skin, not even the deeper, the deeper skin. So an espresso treatment then is needed for patients that have um, a more extensive or deeper uh, lesions so that the medicine can reach all of the tissues. And the advantage of systemic immunosuppressant is that it can target areas where you may not have um, identified that there's active disease, but then a month later you might realize, oh, there's actually something there. The limitations though is that it, since it suppresses your immune system, you can have an increased risk for infection and systemic medicines can also have other side effects. So treatment then is gonna depend upon the disease pattern. So we're talking about active disease here and there are many signs uh, that are associated with um, skin activity, such as it's newer, larger, or deeper. It has a erythema, which means a red coloring or a violaceous color, um, or it sort of has this waxy kind of feeling, which is white or yellow. There's skin thickening and there is warmth. And so if you have a low risk for severe damage, like you have a superficial plaque lesion, you don't have any um, extracutaneous involvement, topical may be fine. But if you have a moderate or high risk for severe damage, meaning you have deep tissue involvement, extracutaneous involvement, cranial facial involvement, extensive skin disease, or rapidly progressing disease, we are going to want to treat those patients with systemic immunosuppressants to make sure we can try to get this under control as quickly as possible. For systemic immunosuppressive treatment, the first line is methotrexate, and that's been supported by one randomized clinical trial in kids, where 67% of the patients were found to have a sustained response. Um, um, a systematic literature review supports its, review, its use. There's also been um, consensus agreement on using methotrexate by pediatric rheumatologists worldwide in the North American organization, CARA, Childhood Arthritis Rheumatology Research Alliance, and then the European um, and other parts of the world press, Pediatric Rheumatology European Society, Society um, that endorsed, as well as by uh, European Dermatology Association and Japanese Dermatology Association. Um, limitations of methotrexate include nausea, vomiting, stomach aches, decreased appetite, malaise, um, and this is often used with um, corticosteroids. Um, El Elena uh, raised a question about when would you use um, mycophenolate, so Celsep rather than methotrexate as first line. So we're gonna get to um, mycophenolate in a little bit. Um, and sorry, uh, Amiko asked, um, are Uncudasab and Perry Romberg of the same disease on different parts of the head? Um, they can, so they don't, they are, so it's, it's typically you have one or the other, but maybe about 25-30% um, of the patients can have both. Um, and they typically are occurring on the same side of the face, not on the two different sides. We treat both with the same medications. So the steroids could be um, by pulse intravenous um, once a week or three days per month, or oral prednisone or prednisolone. And the limitation with steroids is are many. So weight increase, mood changes, increased blood pressure, diabetes, bone density, ulcers, cataracts, so a, a lot. So we use steroids, but we don't like to rely on steroids for long-term treatment. And methotrexate has really improved outcomes. So in this um, sort of collation of articles um, up to 2000, and then two studies later on, um, where in the earlier cohort, less than 1% of the patients have been treated with methotrexate. In the later one, 97% were treated with methotrexate, um, 160 versus 380 patients. Uh, the linear mixed morphia, which we tend to think of as quite um, 
you know, more likely to have problems um, was higher in the later cohort. Joint involvement frequency was decreased um, in the cohorts associated with methotrexate use. So 50% pre-methotrexate, 23% in the, in the with methotrexate treatment. Problems like limb length difference also fell quite a bit. So 23% in the pre-methotrexate to 9% uh, post um, with methotrexate. And functional impairment also fell. So 39% and then 27%. Um, we have another uh, question from Katie. Katie, in oncological impairment, seizures, is it possible for the seizures to decrease or even cease once the inflammation is decreased or becomes inactive? Yes, that has been reported that um, seizures um, can um, decrease or stop with uh, treatment with methotrexate or other medications. Um, and what are the tests to indicate remission or flaring? I think we're going to get to it. You guys are all ahead of me, which is good. Okay. So when can we expect improvement on methotrexate? So most um, juvenile localized scleroderm patients are going to improve in the first three months. So this is um, graphs from two different studies where the patients were started on methotrexate. Um, in the study on the left, this was um, a CARA study where there were three different methotrexate um, treatment regimens, all the same methotrexate dose, but um, in two of the arms, the patients got either IV steroids or oral steroids. And on the right, it was a European study where all the patients got um, steroids with the methotrexate. So um, in, the, in the blue is the Physician Global Assessment of Disease Activity, which you could see is dropping over time. In the red and purple are two skin activity measures, um, which you could also see are falling with time. So by three months, we can see that um, we have a drop in activity level in both studies. And by six months, the activity level is quite low. So quite a bit drop from baseline. So we should, by six months, expect to see improvement. And then how long do we treat? Um, this is a big question that we unfortunately don't have um, the, um, the answer for, except for general um, guidelines. So this really needs to be individualized. Sorry. Um, so um, we are looking to suppress all active signs. So that's both skin and excretaneous features. We want those all to be um, resolved. How long to treat after that is less is less clear. We're aiming mission, which means an inactive disease state. When I surveyed um, our CARA members, our North American pediatric rheumatologists, as to how long they would treat after all active signs were resolved, 40% said they wanted 12 months of no active features on medication. So 12 months after the, there was felt to be no active signs, before they would say that that patient was in remission. So it's not really like the next day you can say the patient's in remission because this disease is often hard to monitor and detect, so 12 months. And then after that, people are still often treating longer or starting to taper the meds at that point. Francesco Zulian in Italy, um, in their evaluation of 50 patients with linear disease, the mean treatment duration was 3.1 years with a range of 1.8 to 8.5 years. In all cases, even once the patient's off medicine, you really want long-term monitoring as relapses have been reported in 16 to 40%, and that could be after 15 to 20 months off of treatment, but it can also occur years later. I think that this really high rate um, is likely reflecting our um, limited ability to detect activity that's deeper. Um, which goes to um, Amiko's question. Uh, there's a question from Katie as to, does puberty have any Im impact on how effective medications could be? Uh, not that we are aware of. So what's associated with poor response? So we have, um, um, it's been shown in um, one of Francesco Sulian's studies that um, delayed a delay in starting the treatment is going to decrease the likelihood that the child will go into remission. 
and they found just a 79 day delay. So a mean of 144 days before starting treatment versus 65 days was significant for um, having a lower remission likelihood. This subtype makes a difference. So the deeper subtypes, pansclerotic morphia, mixed morphia, linear scleroderma, having widespread disease and having extra cutaneous, cutaneous involvement. A prospective study where the patients were followed six months, I showed you that um, activity plot. The um, activity level, sorry, that was a different study I showed you. This is a different study. The activity level at baseline, uh, zero months for patients with extracutaneous involvement or without was the same. But at six months, while the, the activity level had decreased without extracutaneous involvement, it was still high in those with extracutaneous involvement. And in this study, more of the patients that had extracutaneous involvement received treatment courses and they received them for longer periods of time. Uh, there's a question from Elena as to delay from what? Um, I'm not really sure what's that referring to. Treatment initiation first bullet point. So it's just delay in starting treatment. So if treatment is not started for under 44 days versus you started it after 65 days, you were less likely to achieve remission. Um, this is, um, it's not, you know, this is a retrospective study. So in terms of you know, is that feasible that you can identify the lesion and treat it within 65 days? I think that that's difficult in many um, situations and that's certainly not the norm. So I think we don't have full data on exactly what they mean, but I think they mean from when the lesion showed up. Um, other options, if the patient's methotrexate intolerant or non responsive responsive are going to include mycophenolate mofetil salcept and that use is strongly recommended by pediatric rheumatologists. It's less likely to give some of the side effects of methotrexate um, such as the nausea, um, malaise, fatigue. It may be better at decreasing fibrosis than methotrexate. Um, it, that's what's been found in systemic sclerosis, systemic sclerosis. Um, but it is medicine. It is also a lot more expensive. So it isn't the standard uh, first-line treatment. Methotrexate is the first standard first-line treatment. And then if that's poorly tolerated, um, then I would say you would switch to mycophenolate mofetil. In terms of biologic agents, um, um, abatacepzumab have a number of case reports and small series that suggest that th these are quite effective. Um, these are not approved for localized scleroderma. So they're not so easy to obtain, unfortunately, to use for treatment. Um, other small molecules that are used are cyclosporin, hydroxychloroquine, and more recently, JAK inhibitors, such as tofacitinib. There's a lot less data about these medicines. Hydroxychloroquine in a Mayo study was shown to be effective, but they, um, they were dealing with patients with milder disease. So I would say that hydroxychloroquine is um, something good as an add-on, but not as a first-line treatment. So I would say methotrexate or mycophenolate are the ones you wanna do first line. Um, and then other therapies are gonna include physical therapy, occupational therapy, so that anyone that has joint limitation, you really wanna work on that because the treatment is reducing the inflammation, but any limitation you have is not going to go away unless you start moving it. Also, patients that have muscle atrophy, limb length differences, we want to improve their function. And it's really important to encourage your child to just be active and exercise and play. Skin care, skin, skin care you want to moisturize thinner or harder areas. Some protection is also important for reducing uh, the dispigmentation looking worse. Um, Botox is, has been used for neurological problems and that can help, help with problems like spasm, headaches. And then there's corrective or cosmetic surgery, um, which involves um, fillers, um, either fat or synthetic. 
um, and we advise against performing surgery while the patient has active disease because, um, as I told you initially, um, you know, this is maybe an aberrant scleroderma, maybe is an aberrant reaction to injury. So surgery is obviously an injury to that area. Um, there has been report of disease flaring afterwards. Okay, okay. And let's see. Uh, Amiko says, we reduced my son's uh, cells up dosage recently. Is it okay to revert to the original dosage? He's on Kudasab and also appears to be showing signs of Perry Romberg since the mycophenolate was decreased. Yeah, so I think unfortunately um, this is this this can be hard to tell with Berg because you're not seeing much skin signs. Um, and so with the Ankudasab, um, you may see signs, but the the face head has very little tissue, so it's often hard to tell. We use ultrasound to monitor some of our patients to try to help with this. MRI is not super sensitive for detecting superficial um, like skin and the superficial muscle tissue. So I think trying to compare photographs, seeing if that area is warmer would be um, concerns as to whether it's still active or not. Um, and Haley asks, can joint pains happen with Ongodisab or Perry Romberg? Uh, yeah, so extracutaneous involvement, I said, was usually near the site of skin lesion, but about 25 to 30 percent of the time, it's remote. So you can definitely get arthritis um, when you have Ankudasab or Perry Romberg or arthritis in um, unaffected site. Um, so that's why I think we're on to the next slide. Um, you know, the European consensus rec recommendations uh, that were published in 2019 say refer all kids to a specialized pediatric rheumatology center if you're suspecting that they have um, localized scleroderma. And that's because we really want to do a full joint exam in all of our patients at diagnosis and follow up. We just want to make sure that you're not developing something, even if it's not next to the skin area. The skin should be monitored for activity and damage routinely. And we want to um, have an eye screen in everyone at um, at baseline at diagnosis. Um, so this is a slit lamp exam for uh, deep eye inflammation, uveitis. Um, that's done by an ophthalmologist. And for those that have cranial facial involvement, that facial involvement that should be followed regularly, especially when you start tapering the medicine. You want to make sure they get checked. Um, and it's it's unclear how much we have to do this for all patients, but it's a consideration. For craniofacial involvement, we want to do dental orthodontic maxil maxillofacial evaluation. Um, that's a diagnosis and follow up. And MRI of the head at the head at diagnosis was recommendations with craniofacial involvement. That's probably a little bit more controversial, less data on that, just because the MRI findings don't correlate. Um, so well um, consistently with um, the patient's neurological symptoms. But um, I think it, it certainly doesn't hurt to do that if your child doesn't have to be sedated for the MRI. The long-term prognosis for remission is good. Um, so most patients go into remission. Um, this is from Martini um, Francesco Zulian in Italy. They did a retrospective study looking at 129 uh, patients. And so in blue means it's partial remission. And this is over time from one year to 10 years. And then in green is complete remission. So in the first year, they said that 85% of the patients were in partial remission. And you could see that the it's pretty high, the blue, and then it's going down over time. And then the green starts picking up. So at five years, um, a little more than half were in complete remission. And then that increases at seven years to 86%. Um, and 10 years, they said it's 83%. So the pattern is partial remission pretty early on with treatment. And then um, we start picking up the complete remission. The red indicates active disease. So unfortunately, there is a subset of patients that will still have active disease even 10 years out. Um, so again, long-term monitoring is important because some patients will flare, as you could see by these red um, spikes here. And then another issue is that damage is common. So moderate to severe damage was in almost half of the patients. 
and that bad damage can appear early. Functional limitation was in about 20% of the patients here, um, more common with the linear uh, subtype of the trunk or limb. Um, Christina asks, do we currently advocate that all localized patients see a pediatric rheumatologist? Um, I think that the pediatric rheumatologists feel that we should all, the pediatric rheumatologists should see all patients with localized scleroderma just to check, just to check them because our do joint exams, do, do full organ system assessments, whereas the dermatologist focus is only on the skin so that um, pediatric rheumatologists have many, you know, examples in their clinics of patients that came to them to their clinics late from dermatology where the patient has some joint limitation or limb difference um, because it's not something that the dermatologist is focused on unlike the rheumatologist. So I would advocate uh, for that. So then um, just to sort of uh, finish up soon, active research efforts, uh, there are many and there's been over the recent years, international research um, efforts by the European community and the North American community. Currently, there's a joint study going on um, led by Claire Payne in the UK and Christy Ziegler in, um, at Duke. Um, a SCORE study, which was funded by the National Scleroderma Foundation, a Cassie Torkis PI, I'm one of the co eyes And so we are going to be able to look at treatment response, and we're going to have more data evaluating methotrexate versus mycophenolate. This SCORE study also has um, tran uh, translational studies um, with the patients being tracked for two years after they started treatment. So this will be very exciting to see if we can identify biomarkers that might be associated with treatment response or failure. There's efforts to develop outcome measures. Um, so a quality of life measure uh, was developed by Chrissy Ziegler, Kevin Ardlin, Cassie Turek, and that's being evaluated now with Claire Payne, myself in the uh, UK and other European countries. An extracutaneous morbidity measure um, was developed in CARA, and we're um, now evaluating that in the European groups. 3D craniofacial imaging, which is likely to help monitor for changes as um, Amico brought up. Um, I've been working on developing a mobile app for evaluating lesion size, which then would facilitate more um, physicians, being able, physicians being able to track the scan. Um, Leanna Stubbs has been leading an effort to identify barriers to care. And we have many questions to answer still, such as what's the best treatment, which is going to be a balance of efficacy, tolerability, safety, and it's going to depend upon the disease pattern. How long do we need to treat? Can we identify a biomarker to track marker to track disease activity disease? Can we identify the patient at risk for more severe problems earlier? Can we restore normal growth once impaired? So there is a great need for more sensitive tools to identify deep tissue activity earlier. Um, current tools include ultrasound MRI, but each has strengths and limitations. So I uh, take home messages are that localized scleroderma is not the same thing as systemic sclerosis, different diseases, different process, and you don't have to worry that localized is going to turn into systemic sclerosis. Juvenile localized scleroderma is worse than adult onset because it has deeper subtypes, extracutaneous involvement, longer disease duration. Treatment and prognosis has improved greatly since 2000 and continues to improve. Management by pediatric rheumatologists is recommended. Long-term monitoring is essential. And research is ongoing to improve our understanding of localized scleroderma and work towards improving long-term outcome. Many studies going on, so I think lots of hope. So uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues and the patients and families who have participated in our studies and our research coordinators and our funding sources. So thank you all for your attention and um, any questions, please feel free to bring them up. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. I don't know if I missed anybody's questions. Uh, are there tests to indicate remission or flaring? So I think uh, we have the skin activity measures that are going to show a change. And then 
Uh, we're working on developing an extracutaneous measure, which I think would also help with that. Um, but ideally, we would have uh, the blood tests are of limited use for most patients. No questions. I answered everyone's questions. Maybe. How can parents help? Christine asked. Um, lots of ways. So, um, so in CARA, um, we with your research, etc. Um, so I think that you know parents can help um, can help uh, guide some of the research agenda. So we have um, in CARA we have a pediatric scleroderma work group, and so we have uh, several parents that have been participating with us in that. Um, we're going to be starting to analyze some of that score data. So I think that the parents can help um, with guiding some of that. The barriers to care survey that I mentioned before, um, that was started by Christina um, Loki um, and myself in a conversation. And then Leanna Stubbs took that over, which is great. Um, and then, you know, we do need, of course, um, families to be willing to participate in studies. So we've been doing prospective studies, um, but the translational studies is a way to get more. Um, uh, what are noted uh, centers of specialization and treatment of localized scleroderma? So um, Amigo asked that. So that is on the Scleroderma Foundation website. Um, my center is, you know, has been designated as Scleroderma Center of Excellence. You have to apply for that so that you're doing research. Um, but I think there's some errors in that because my center is listed as dermatology, which I'm not. Um, so, um, so I guess, so I think, you know, we are making more effort for that, but um, I think the Scleroderma Foundation reaching out to Angel is a good place. Um, Elena says, as someone going through the process of pushing her medications and running into barriers in light of the lack of FDA approved treatment, what role does FDA approval treatment play in the work being done? Is that a priority or is that secondary? I think um, it's very difficult to get um, FDA approval. It's very expensive. So we try to, you know, we are trying to get pharmaceutical companies to be interested in our disease, but being a rare disease um, and being kids are worse, worse. Um, then it doesn't help us because it means that there isn't a big market. Um, so often to get medicines approved for my patients that need more, I may relabel them as having another disease like juvenile idiopathic arthritis where there's more meds approved. So I can try to say that they need this medicine too. Um, or, you know, because I think that that generally, is, that generally is more effective than just trying to appeal to the insurance company, which can easily diagnose deny it. Um, I think that's, um, I just want to get to some of these other. Harish um, Chandran says that I'm based in India. My daughter has localized scleroderma. Any points of contact in India who can help? Uh, yes, there are people in India that um, I can um, let Angel know so that um, he can, you know, reach out. Like I said, we're trying to do more international studies so that um, we are just trying to raise the level of um, treatment, you know, worldwide. Um, and Emiko asked about any resources to do with emotional social aspects. So please stick around for the last um, session on mental health challenges for the family with scleroderma. Okay, so that we have a great panel that was put together that is going to talk about um, resources and help for the caregiver as well as for um, the child. Um, I think if you can get your child to participate in tomorrow's session, it would be a big help because, um, you know, the kids need to feel that they're part of a community. And so there's probably no one in their school that has this problem. And if it's on your face, you know, everyone notices and will ask you about it. So um, I think that this is a big concern. So I strongly encourage you to think about going to the in-person conferences um, 
the families who have gone can talk about how it's really helped their kids. And, you know, kids like to have their school friends, their sports friends, their scleroderma friends, right? So that if they want to, you know, they're feeling down about their disease or taking medicines, they can contact their scleroderma friends and they don't have to go through, oh, I'm taking methotrexate and their friend's asking what's methotrexate, right? They're dealing with kids who are going through the same thing. So I think really having some support is important, but, um, you know, I think trying to, um, you know, really stick around for the later sessions, they should be of help. Um, and if you have suggestions as to what you'd like to see in these conferences, um, you know, please, you know, put that in your comments because, um, you know, we develop these conferences to help families. So we're doing based on, you know, what we hear, what we think is important, but um, there, may be, um, there may be things that we missed. So. I, I really encourage you to get involved. I encourage you to get involved with the Scleroderma Foundation. The bigger the community we have, the more we can, you know, lobby the FDA or other people, right? Christina Loki can talk about that. She's gone to DC. She's gone to, you know, our state. She got an, a Scleroderma Day set up in our state because of her efforts. So again, you know, it doesn't necessarily take a huge amount of effort to get things going, but it, you have to show that there is a need and there are people that feel this need, right? So we as physicians are advocating, but it, we're much stronger if we work with families to advocate. Um, other points, sorry, sorry. I think these are all great uh, things to bring up in discussion and I hope um, Christina may be able to join in the discussion to sort of help guide families towards, you know, figuring out a way to move forward. Um, the good thing about localized scleroderm again, is that it does um, for nearly all patients go into remission. The bad thing is that there is, you know, damage and, you know, suffering, having to take medicines in the interim. Um, so um, it's much better than it was before. When I was reviewing the literature in 2000, you know, there was a statement in a peer reviewed paper saying there's no medical treatments that work for this disease. And, and so that we've shown to be wrong. Okay, so um, there is more work to be done um, to make this even better. Christina, do you want, do you want to get on to um, say something? I guess I can do that, right? to to go on the screen. I don't know how to do that, Angel. Sorry. Um, so how do I do this? Can you can you sh share this, um, Angel? Hello, Dr. Lee. Um, so the jump on screen for the attendees is not uh, enabled for this session. Okay. 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 We did just open up the networking rooms, okay. um, and folks will be able to jump in there and interact. Okay. 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 So just you know, I think if you could go to Christina said that my daughter loved going to D.C. and speak with um, lawmakers. It was a very empowering experience and. Um, Julie asked, do our kids have to register separately for tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, maybe um, if you could uh, send a message to Angel, um, he could try to help you with that. Um, but I, you know, it's supposed to be a pain party, but it's basically just, you know, and I told some of my patients that have facial disease, you can just keep your video screen dark. You don't have to show your face if you don't want to. But again, I think having um, a connection with another kid that has something similar to what you have um, is just can make a huge difference. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Lee and a big thank you to all of our attendees. Um, we'll be getting ready to start our next round of sessions in about 10 minutes. Um, and I'm excited.
excited to see you there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.